I'd like to read from 1 Timothy 4, 12. I'll read from 12 to the end. Let no man despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things, give yourself wholly to them, that your profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto yourself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will both save yourself and them that hear you. Verse 12 again. Let no man despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conversation, that is, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Let's just pray. Father, we ask you to be our teacher by your Spirit. We are about of yesterday, the Bible says, and know nothing. We agree to that. We know it's true. And Father, we need light from you. We trust you for it. In Christ's name, amen. The Apostle Paul, an older preacher, was writing to a younger preacher and exhorting him along certain lines, as we know, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. He says, let no man despise your youth. That's not my problem. They may despise me because of my age. When they find out I'm 73, what can he say? You know, today, if you're past 30, you've lost half of your marbles, and if you're past 70, you've lost all of them. I mean, that's how they feel. If they get a resume, They ask a lot of questions that the Bible doesn't ask, and the questions the Bible doesn't ask, they don't even consider. I mean, when calling a pastor. Ordaining councils, I've sat on them, I've moderated some ordaining councils, and the questions the Bible asks about a pastor, you know, they're they're never asked. Somehow, it's all taken for granted, 1 Timothy chapter 3. And of course, It's wrong. You know, there's an old saying, marry in haste and repent at leisure, and churches have had to do the same thing, if you know what I mean, in calling a pastor. The questions they want to know, of course, are these. Where did you get your training? Well, I'm finished right there. I never got any. That is, not in formal schools. Of course, Moody wouldn't have made it either. Finney wouldn't have made it. Charles Spurgeon wouldn't have made it. They never had any training either. That is no formal training. We all have training, but in different ways. And there are other things considered as well. Let no man despise your youth. When Gypsy Smith, before he became an evangelist, He pastored a Methodist church in England, his first church. He sat on the platform, the opening meeting. They were considering him as a pastor. And he sat there about ten minutes past starting time and said nothing, just looking the congregation over. And finally somebody said, young man, don't you realize it's ten minutes past starting time? He said, yes, I'm aware of that. He said, did you ever hear of a doctor prescribing a remedy without diagnosing the case? 
so whoever it was sat down. A few minutes later, a lady got up and said, You are altogether too young for us. Lady, he said, Stick around, I'll be older. And, uh, you know, at the end of the first year, so many people have been saved, the church had grown dramatically. Nobody was asking these kind of questions any longer. Would you believe it? I had a crusade in Washington several years ago, and before I got there, I discovered that the pastor was 75 and the youth pastor was 81. And I thought to myself, now, you know, we're going to have about 30 people, old people, with moss on their eyebrows, I mean, with this kind of a leadership. I couldn't have been, I couldn't have been more wrong. I mean, they had a fantastic church. Lots of young people, lots of young married couples. And these two guys, I mean, it did my heart good, you know. They really had it going. It's the only first, I mean, it's the first time in 50 years in the ministry I saw anything like this, but it was sort of encouraging. Moses never got started until he was 80. Apparently, in some things, God doesn't look at us the way we do. Let no man despise your youth. But this meant that Timothy somehow had to gain respect. It wasn't going to come naturally because he was young. We have a tendency to write people off if they're young. They don't have much to say. So somehow he had to gain respect. And Christian workers, we have to gain respect. It doesn't come because we've got a lot of training and so on. My wife and I once saw the resume of a pastor who had just been kicked out of his church, asked to resign, to put it more politely. And uh, he had, I mean, the training he had, there was just no end to it, and degrees and degrees and degrees and degrees, the whole thing. Now, I'm not opposed to that in the slightest. He couldn't find a church because his track record wasn't there. He had the training, but somehow... He couldn't, the people didn't respect him. And it's something we have to gain. Whether we're a Christian worker or not, we have to gain respect before we can expect people to listen to what we have to say. That's not true in all circumstances, I know. Let no man despise your youth, but be an example You know, conduct speaks louder than words, and sometimes we nullify what we say by the way we live. And our example can preach louder sometimes than our our sermons do. I know a pastor in Western Canada. He started several churches. When you meet him, he doesn't have any charisma, whatever that is. And when he preaches, it's not any big, big deal. But every church he started, it just grows and grows and grows. I had meetings with him one time and he said, you know, I can't explain it. He said, we're growing on the average of 30 people a month. I don't even know where they come from. People, I think it was his example more than anything else. He just loved people. He just loved everybody. And he was faithful. And he set a godly example in every respect and aspect of his walk with God. And it spoke. Louder than the sermons could. I remember hearing a preacher one time in Akron, Ohio, years ago. He only had grade five education. He murdered the Queen's English every time he spoke. His preaching was like the book of Proverbs, all text, no context. He preached like this. Now watch it, you people. And he'd say something great. Now watch it, you people. He'd say something else that was great, totally unrelated, you know. And this is how the sermon went. His, his printed sermons were dull. But when the guy preached, there was a power there. It was totally different. 
And he met a fellow named Notley Nash, I think it was, and they shook hands and he said to this fellow, he challenged him, he said, listen, let's build, let's, for the glory of God, let's build the biggest Sunday school in the world. And they did. For years they had the biggest Sunday school in the world. I think God had tried with others and couldn't get through to the public on them, so he got this guy who didn't know anything, who, but who obviously had some administrative gifts, obviously. The church had 16,000 members, and my wife and I were there. We were not there for a crusade. We were there as observers. The church now has 22,000 members. They had to build a larger building. When we were there, it just seated 5,000. It seats 7,000 now. And the son of this fellow is now the pastor. Anyway, we're to be an example. In 1 Timothy 1, Paul spoke about, the, uh, about this matter of example. He said that in me first, Jesus Christ, might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them who should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So Paul, as you know, if you read Second Corinthians 11 and other places in the New Testament, you know how Paul went through a lot of problems. Oh, he was mobbed, left for dead, stoned, beaten, shipwrecked, spent a day and a half drifting in the ocean, it says, in perils among false brethren, I mean, it's a terrible catalog of bad things that happened. But he said he was a pattern. God intended him to be a pattern to those who should hereafter believe on him. And certainly he's been a challenge to me, and I'm sure to thousands, no doubt, millions of other people. When Paul wrote to Titus, another younger preacher, chapter 2, verse 7, he told him to be a pattern of good works. This was something different again, a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, purity, uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. Like it says in Ephesians chapter 5, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not befitting, but rather giving of thanks. There's nothing wrong with a little humor, but you know, sometimes we get caught up in this and it's all humor. And sometimes you have a speaker who spends ten minutes telling jokes. They call it breaking the ice. You know what it really does, people? It builds ice. It's not the way to do it. See. I can't imagine the Apostle Paul standing up and cracking jokes for ten minutes. Can you? Well, I can't either. A pattern, doctrine, uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech, that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to save you. You know, Spurgeon in his younger days, he said himself, he was very bombastic at times. Someone asked a liberal preacher in London what he thought of Spurgeon. He said, he's a very saucy dog. And he had that reputation of being a very saucy dog. But he had a grandfather who helped him. And when he had been a little too bombastic, he'd come home and find a Bible stuck on his bed or beside his bed and a pin in Titus 2.7. Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. All Spurgeon said, he really helped me. And then a lady one time, she came to reproach him because he used a little humor. He didn't use a lot of it, but he used some. And he said, lady, if you knew how much I held back, you'd feel sorry for me. All right. A pattern. Ever think of it that way? Your life, a pattern that others see. In 1 Corinthians 4, Paul said, we are made a spectacle, and the Greek word there is the word from which we get the English word theater. We're made a theater, that is, we're on stage, to the world, to angels, to men. I think he means Christian men. The world sees it, Christians see it. Demons see it, good angels see it, we're on stage whether we like it or not. We're being watched. So it matters how we live, what we say, where we go, how we spend our money, how we spend our time. It says in Hebrews 12, make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame, that's the sinner be turned out of the way. 
In Isaiah it says, they've made them crooked paths. Whosoever goes therein shall not know peace. And sometimes sinners following Christians get so tangled up because a Christian walks in crooked paths that they just never make it. They get turned away totally. I've known of a few cases like that over the years, and possibly you have as well. Well, let's make sure that we are not like that. A sinner may be watching you or watching me and taking what inspiration they can get from our life. Let's walk straight. I remember hearing, I think it was Ralph one time in a meeting where a fellow got up to share and uh, he, the rules of the sharing were no preaching and if you can't find the landing field, we'll help you come down. And he couldn't quite find the landing field and then we, he was stopped. I forget exactly how that was done, but we have polite ways of doing that. And so he, he said, well, he said, I'm just flying so high. And Ralph said, we don't care how high you fly as long as you walk the straight path when you come down. And Ralph didn't know that it was a shaft from God because this particular man shortly after was disciplined by his own church on a rather serious charge. Anyway, be an example to the believers in word. It says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. Now, corrupt means rotten. Don't let anything rotten come out of your mouth that will hurt somebody else. It says of a virtuous woman in Proverbs 31 that in her tongue was the law of kindness. Her tongue was guided by the law of kindness. She was careful what she said, lest she hurt, should hurt some other person intentionally or unintentionally. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. So we should think before we speak. And think in terms of trying to say something that will help somebody else. They said, Harry Ironside, he's dead now, which means he's more alive than ever. He was pastor of the Moody Church in Chicago for many years. Under his ministry, they often have to have double services to get the people in. The church seats almost 5,000. It's not quite that way today. I think when Irvin Lutzer took over, they were down to around 800. They've come up over 2,000 for Sunday mornings, I know. I'm not sure where it's at now. But, but Ironside had a happy facility of turning conversations into spiritual channels. They said he worked at it constantly. If he's in a home having coffee with a bunch of Christians, he was always trying to, to get the conversation around the spiritual things, things that would edify. And not waste time. One of my nephews, my youngest brother's oldest son, pastor of the church I attend in Winnipeg, is dying of cancer. They say he probably has no longer than two weeks to live. Forty-six years of age. Two children, a wife that's not well. If you think of him, pray for them. His name is Gary. His wife's name is Dorothy. I mention him because... Just recently, he met with two of the board members and said something like this. I thought I had 20 or 30 years more to serve God. I don't have. He said, brethren, tell the board, give it all you've got. Give it all you've got while you can, because you never know what the future holds. None of us know. In word, be careful what you say. Jesus in Matthew 15 said, It's not that which goes in your mouth that pollutes you, it's what comes out of your mouth that defiles you. What we say defiles you, he said, because it comes from the heart. What you say comes from the heart. See, out of the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so we speak what we are. Sometimes we can camouflage that to an extent. But basically, we speak what we are. And further along that same line, sin is really an extension of myself. I sin because of what I am. 
I love to blame it on my wife or my husband, my kids or my parents, my neighbor or my job. But Jeremiah 3.13 says, Only acknowledge your iniquity that you have transgressed against the Lord your God. Only be, only admit it, God says. Only acknowledge it. Stop blaming it on something else. In the whole of chapter 5, there's an interesting insight there along these lines. It says, they, that's Israel, they'll go with their flocks and with their herds, they're going to sacrifice to God. They go with their flocks and their herds to seek the Lord, but they shall not find Him. He has withdrawn Himself from them. I read that, I say to myself, why? I read further in chapter 5, and I find out in the last verse. God said, I will go and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. They were seeking the face of God. They were not admitting their failures. They were not admitting their sins. So they never got through. And that's, that's still true, of course, today. Why is this in the Bible? Romans 15, Paul said about the Old Testament Scriptures, whatever things were written before were written for our instruction, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. So Hosea 5, 6 and 15, that was written for us today. Now, modern reading says until they be guilty. That's what the Hebrew says, until they are guilty. So I'll go and return to my place until they're guilty and acknowledge their offense. That's what God has said. Now, we're in word, a pattern, in word and conduct. It says in Hebrews 13, let your conduct be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Are you content with what you have? Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Oh, wait a minute, this is North America. We've got to have more than that. Really? In James chapter 2, it says, hearken, that means listen, Hearken, my beloved brethren, has not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to them that love him? Why are poor people rich in faith? Dear people, they're rich in faith because they have to be in order to survive. It is never a bad thing to be poor. Never. It's there that we learn how to trust God. And you pray and God answers and your faith is increased. In North America, in our evangelical culture, we try to avoid problems of any kind. The political system is built on that. They're trying to erode away everything they can that would stand in a person's way. Forgetting that we need these things. You remember what it says in 1 Peter chapter 1 about the Lord Jesus, whom having not seen you love in whom though now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy and speak and full of glory. But in the same context he says, Now, for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than a gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You know, we pray, God, give me more faith, so God gives us more trials. Hey, God, what's going on here? I ask for more faith. So God gives me more trials. People, it's through trials that our faith is increased. I don't know of any other way. I know faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. As a young Christian, I came across this verse in Mark 11. Have faith in God? I don't know why. It really spoke to my heart. So I was reading the Bible through for the first time. At the top of every page, I still have this Bible at home somewhere, I wrote across the top of the page, Have faith in God. I did that for every page in the Bible. But I can't honestly say that writing that down like that did anything for me. So I remembered the verse, of course, have faith in God. And it, we have to have the Bible to increase our faith. That's part of it, but it certainly isn't all. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings that when His glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. I think of my nephew. He got sick last January. Dear people, he had headaches so bad, he would just curl up in the bed in a fetal position and hope to survive. Day after day. Everything he ate, he had to throw up. 
He got pains in his, in his legs. He would shriek with the pain in time. I haven't yet heard a word of complaint from him or his wife. He knows he, he, it's all in the hands of God. And a lot of us have been learning watching him. You know, the trial of our faith. Much more precious than a gold that perishes. Though it be tried with fire, and it may be, yours may be, mine may be. We've had lots of trials in the past. But you know, I think of that verse that says, The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Not worthy to be compared. I never heard of anybody getting to heaven early and then complaining. Did you? Of course not. We do the complaining down here. But to go back where I just started a few moments ago, having food and clothing, let us be there with content. Listen, do you know something? I can give your total biography in four words. Do you believe it? You can give me mine in four words. Do you know what they are? Nothing in, nothing out. First Timothy 6. We brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And did you know that's based on a verse in Ecclesiastes that says basically the same thing? I mean, people, that's our total biography. Nothing in, nothing out. So, let's live for God. Only what's done for Christ will last. God, bodily exercise profits for a little time. But godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and also of that which is to come. Exercise yourself, it says, rather unto godliness. There are people that have exercised their hearts with covetous practices, and, and Peter calls them cursed children. Let's not be that. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Even in our evangelical circles, dear people, we tend to think of a person who's made a million dollars as being a real success. I mean, why do we do this? This is from the world. Here's a person, he may be a thousand dollars in the red. He may mean more to God than the person with a million dollars in the bank. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things which he possesses. And that's true for you. It's true for me. Let me say something else. If you aren't content with what you have now, you won't be content no matter what God gives you. The eye is not filled with seeing and the ear is not filled with hearing. And he that loves abundance will never be satisfied with increase. It says that. You want more? You'll always want more. I heard a, about a lady in Scotland, very poor. She didn't have much to eat, just a little crust of bread. And she held this up like this, and she said, Dear God, all this? And heaven too? Oh, I thought that was great. I mean, it spoke to my heart. Spirit in love and you know the Bible just exhausts language in talking about love it says we're to walk in love Ephesians chapter 5 let love be without hypocrisy in Romans chapter 12 keep yourself in the love of God in the book of Jude Paul will ask for love 1 Corinthians chapter 14 the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. This I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in all knowledge and all judgment. In Philippians chapter 1, seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit, 
Unto, and the word there means motion toward. Unto what? Unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart, fervently being born again. We sometimes think, you know, that when you talk about a Christian being filled with the love of God, that should happen long after conversion, a real deep and powerful work of the Spirit. But in 1 Peter 1, it's linked to, to being born again. Let's look at it again. Seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again. People, it should start, start automatically, see. How does faith work? Faith works by love, Galatians 5, 6. As a matter of fact, faith and love occur together 32 times, at least, I found that many times, and maybe more. Faith and love. Remember without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all towards each other abounds. A pattern in love. Are we really that? Why is it, you know, when the door slams shut behind us in the house, that the growling starts and the complaining and the criticizing and all the rest of it? Now, the kids watch that. They pick up the vibrations and they turn out to be the same as we are. And we wonder why. We prayed so much for them. How come they turned out like me? You know. Well, because you were the example they had. I mean, what else? It's not always true. Moody had a son that became a liberal preacher, preached to, and Tory took him to task publicly. Billy Sunday had a son who died a drunkard. John Wesley's wife used to drag him around the floor by the hair. And I'm not exaggerating, she actually did. And so, you know... There are exceptions to every rule. Walk in love. First Corinthians 16, 14, it says, Let all your things be done with love. Everything. Everything. But what we do in, in Christian circles, we think that love is strictly for emergencies, like, you know, relatives calling that we didn't invite. And they let you know on the phone they're coming to stay for three days, and you say to us, how in the world can we put up with those, you know, those clods for three days. So you practice smiling in front of the mirror, you know. And well, you put on this front and they come. And you make it, you know, you make it. You're nice to them for three days. You pray day and night, God, give me love, give me love, give me patience. And then they go and you thank God they're gone. Man. Ooh. People. This is what we do see. Love is not for emergencies. Your people are supposed to be a way of life. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the whole week. You're out, you're in, you're out. Walk in love. I say again, let all your things be done with love. And let love be without hypocrisy. Genuine love seeks not her own. That guides me whenever I think of love. Love seeks not her own. I was at Life Action a couple of years ago. Ralph was there too. I don't think he was there when this happened. But I spoke on love. And a fellow went home from this meeting, and he decided to really do it, see. So he's going along, and he saw a guy left his car lights on. He was in a hamburger, and he roared by, and then it hit him. Oh, hey, wait a minute, this guy's lights are on. His battery might be dead. So he whirled around, came back in, the guy's door was open, and so he turned the lights off. Felt better. He's driving along, and uh, he sees a camper pulled over off the road, and there's a couple of ladies sitting in it. So he pulls in, and anything wrong? And uh, the lady says, yeah, my, my mother, she seems to be going into a coma. She's a diabetic, and I just don't know what to do. He says, lady, stay here. I'll get help. So he roars away and gets help, you know, takes care of that. He starts, and this all happened one afternoon, you know, or one evening, whenever. Well, I'm not sure. What, was it the next day or whenever? He was driving along, and he saw a big, a huge camper sitting there and a couple of people in it. And so he pulls in alongside. Can I help you? And again, it was two ladies, and this lady said, well, I'm lost. She said, you know, we've come down here for a family reunion. And I don't know where, I can't find my relatives. He said, do you have a phone? Yeah, I've got a phone number. He said, give me the phone number. You just stay right here. I'll go and get you help. So he goes a couple of miles down the highway, and there's a telephone booth there. And there was two booths, like, you know. And so he's in here, 
And he's phoning this number. And the girl in the next booth was watching, and she saw the number down, and she said, Who are you phoning? And he felt like saying, well, what's, what's it to you? Well, he said, I met a couple of people down the highway. They're lost two ladies, and they gave me this, Ah, oh, it's my mother. I'm looking for her. So she goes tearing down, and, and he felt so good about it. I guess it was the morning session I preached on this, because it was in the evening when he gave his testimony. And he was talking about this one lady in the car, uh, the, I guess the second time he stopped, and he said, and she was an old lady. She must have been, oh, close to 70. And a voice spoke up and said, 68, dearie. And she happened to be in the meeting, and he didn't know it. So, <laughs> so. But he said he just felt so good to interrupt his schedule to help somebody else. You know. so, love seeks not her own. I mean, most of us would sail by, wouldn't we? Well, sure, of course. I mean, there's the telephone a mile down the road. Why don't you put on the telephone, you know? This is how we, you know. Like, for example, in the wintertime, there's a blizzard. Canada went all about this. And you hear somebody stuck in a snowbank. You look out the front window, you and your wife, and it's your neighbor stuck right in front of your house. And his wife is driving, and he's pushing. The kids are up there. They're shoveling and pushing. You look at your watch. I wonder how long it'll take them. Ah, it took them, it took them 18 minutes. Eighteen minutes. Well, spring comes, the snow, of course, is gone, and you're having special meetings in the church in June, and so you decide to go and invite some of your neighbors. So you call on this guy, and boy, is he crusty and cold. You walk back muttering to yourself, man, why, what's wrong with that guy? Whoa, was he ever angry? Well, he's headed for help, sure. Sure, he's headed for help. The problem is... When this neighbor was stuck in the snowbank, he saw this guy and his wife looking out the window, and he doesn't believe in the reality of the, of the Christianity, you know? And he's got a right to make that kind of a judgment. Because we're supposed to be different in the world. We're supposed to be ready to put ourselves out to help other people. And it's... Do you read the Peanuts comic strip? I read it whenever I can. Schultz, the author, is not a born-again believer. He's a religious person. He's always trying to get religious ideas across. And I remember seeing one cartoon, uh, Snoopy the dog was up a tree, and there was a path here, and Snoopy was just glowering at the people down below. And I discovered, I have a book uh, about these things, and uh, this, this represented an evangelist. You see, Schultz hates evangelists. He thinks they're leaping on people trying to scare them into the kingdom of God. But even a stop clock is right twice a day, and he's not always wrong. And one time he had a picture, you know, of Snoopy the dog in a heavy, wet snowstorm. He's here with one foot off the ground. He's shaking and trembling like this. He's obviously he's cold. He's wet. He's uh, cheerless and friendless and all the rest of us. And the kids gather around. And they put their hands on his head and they say, Depart in peace. Be warmed and filled. And then they all walk away. And that's a takeoff from the book of James. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace. Be warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, you give them not the things that are needful to the body. What is the problem? What's that all about? See. So Schultz was right. In word, in conduct, in love, in spirit. Did you ever notice Jacob's testimony to Pharaoh in Genesis 47? Pharaoh said, How old are you? And he said, you and evil to the days of my life being. I haven't attained to the days of the years of pilgrims of my father's. It's been awful, Pharaoh. Oh, I'll tell you. I had to run away from home. One of my brothers was threatening to kill me. He didn't tell him why. I worked for a guy named Laban. Oh, man. Fourteen years. I had to work fourteen years to get my two wives. He, he changed my wages ten times. In the nighttime, the, the, the frost got me. In the daytime, the drought got me. He said, it was terrible. I've had an awful time serving God. And I'm only 130 years old. You know. I say to myself, you know what the next verse says? He blessed Pharaoh. Brother, he needed He just cursed him. You know. He blessed Pharaoh. You know, I've, I don't know. I could be wrong. I wonder if after he was gone, Pharaoh tried to shake the blessing off, you know, because this guy, you know, 
I mean, Jacob was a real believer, yes. But the Bible says fervent in spirit. Billy Bray, this famous Cornish miner that was so used of God in England years ago, he was always praising God, you know, no matter what happened. And somebody said, oh, come on, Billy. You know, it's not always this nice way, you know, is it? Well, he said, I've had some vinegar, but with a teaspoon, I get honey with a ladle. See, sure we get both. What does it say? Rejoice when people persecute you. Leap for joy. We don't. We give up. Somebody said something against us or about us. And we just give up. Somebody lies about us. Listen, in 2 Corinthians 6 it says, In all things are proving ourselves as the ministers of God. And I don't think he means ministers in the sense in which we think. He's just talking about people who serve God. Every Christian is supposed to be a servant of God. In all things are proving ourselves as the ministers of God. He mentions quite a few things there. He mentions by honor and dishonor, by evil report as, and good report, but as deceivers and yet true. We like the true part. And the honorable part, but brother, we don't like the other part. You know. Joseph was accused of rape and thrown in jail. I was in a penitentiary in St. Cloud, Minnesota one time with a Christian superintendent. He said, there's 1,200 prisoners here, and we have a strange jail. He said, you know, he said, there isn't a single guilty person here. Just ask them. Everybody's been framed. Everybody. So Joseph is in jail, and, Joseph, and someone says, hey, Joe, what did you do to wind up here? Well, I was accused of, ra of raping uh, Potiphar's wife, but I never... Oh, yeah, 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 we know, we know. Yeah, I was accused of stealing. I never did it either. So he had to live with that kind of a, of a shadow on him, you know. If you were accused of rape and thrown into jail, would you lose your faith in God? No, brother, listen, God got you into jail so he could do something with you in the jail. You've got to, you know, it says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. You've got to get on top of these things. And before we conclude, we'll say something about that. In spirit. It says, fervent in spirit in Romans chapter 12, doesn't it? Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. In Colossians chapter 3, it says, whatever you do, do it heartily. As unto the Lord, not as unto man. No matter what. Even if nobody's watching, be happy. The Lord's watching. His eyes are on us. Thou, God, seest me. I think it was Billy Graham's wife, Ruth, that she has this sign over her sink that she used to have, and it said, Divine worship conducted here three times a day. You know, she did the dishes three times a day. I like that. In spirit. When people look at you, or me, as a Christian, do they really see any enthusiasm? Do we complain because we had to take a job at the church because we couldn't find somebody to do this job? So I told the pastor, well, if you absolutely, positively can't find anybody, give me a call. I'll think about it. This is how it went. That's how it went in our church. I used to talk about the chairman of the nomination committee. How's it going? Oh, pastor, it is terrible. This was what he told me. But I forget how many positions we have to have filled, 35 or something. I just forget now. He said, Pastor, everybody tells me the same thing. If they just can't find anybody else, give me a call. Maybe I'll be able to do it. But you know what happened after the revival? They had our annual meeting. I said, how's it going? Oh, he said, the phone's ringing off the wall. It's just burning up, he said. Everybody's going to say, give me a job. I'll do anything, you know. But that ought to be normal. That ought to be normal, people. You know, fervent in spirit. Whatever you do, do it heartily, as unto the Lord. And some of you read probably about people in concentration camps, some Christians who had a job for five years of cleaning toilets. Right? Cleaning toilets and praising God all the time. They had a job. They weren't doing that for the camp commandment. They were doing it for God. Whatever you do, do it heartily. A pattern, a pattern, a godly pattern for other people to follow. Spirit, faith, faith. I pointed out before that faith works by love, so you can't get one without the other. Love believes all things. 
When you're walking in love and filled with the love of God, you can believe God for anything. I read an interesting thing. It's sort of a sad commentary on Christian workers, perhaps. But it was over in the Philippines. And there was an area where they had a bad drought. And there were almost no Christians in this area. But the people in this area, they knew that Christians prayed and got answers to prayer. So they sent a delegation down to this church. Asked them if they would come and pray for rain. So what happened? The missionaries said, conferring among themselves, what if we do this and it doesn't rain? Then what? These poor people, they'll figure out God doesn't have any power. So they thought, maybe it wasn't the wisest thing to do, you know. But the people in the church said, oh yes, we'll go and pray and God will send rain. So they went and prayed in the rain. We have a godly pastor in Manitoba, Henry Ozerny, in a town of 3,000. He often runs 500 Sunday morning. God's really used him. He's a man of faith. And several years ago, you know, they had a, a long drought. And so Henry and his church decided they'd pray for rain. So they announced this Saturday, fasting and praying. Everybody come, we'll pray, pray for rain. The media heard about it. Uh, Stonewall, where he is about 20 miles in Winnipeg, the media heard and sent some reporters down. Got pictures and everything. The TV people heard about it. They came down and got pictures of the pastor and the church and the whole thing. And of course, Saturday comes. They were really sweating. <laughs> what if, you know? You know what happened? They prayed and prayed all Saturday. And Saturday night, they got four inches of rain. It flooded the church basement. And the media were all back out again. Let me tell you something. It really helped put his church on the map. We're afraid to venture for fear. God doesn't do it. See. But love believes all things. Purity, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I know people, we live in a very evil age. In Isaiah, speaking of times of way back then, 700 years or more before Christ, every mouth speaks villainy. Everyone is a hypocrite and an evildoer. That's what he wrote. And we live in days like that now. You know what it's like. And I'm not legalistic. Was Paul legalistic when he spoke about 35 different sins in his epistles? Does that make him legalistic? Do you know what legalism is? Legalism in the biblical sense is trying to get to heaven by a mixture of, of grace and works. Now that's legalism. But that's not we've, what we've done with the word today. We say legalism, that's if a guy says you shouldn't be going to movies, you shouldn't be playing cards, you shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be doing that. That's legalism. Well, maybe it is to a certain extent, but it's not really biblical legalism. In any case, to get back. Purity. You know, cold Christians are bound to find that verse in Ecclesiastes that says, Be not righteous over much. Why should you destroy yourself? Say, see, even the Bible says, Solomon, wisest man that ever lived. He said, don't be too righteous, man. I mean, it's in the Bible, isn't it? Sure it is. He said, you might even die before your time. In the context. And people, they forget the book of Ecclesiastes. It's part of the Word of God. But listen, it's a totally different book than any book in the Bible. The writer is reasoning as a natural man under the sun. When he said, all is vanity and vexation of spirit, do you believe that? If you do, what are you doing here today? What am I doing here? Why are we wasting our time here if everything is vanity and vexation of spirit? But as a natural man reasoning under the sun, that's how it looks. That's how the world sees it. The world is saying life is a crude joke. One philosopher said, life is like a bird flying in out of the darkness of the night into an open window, circling twice in a warm room and going out in the darkness again. And to the natural man, that's how it is. Paul wrote and said in Titus, unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. And some people, you know, as Christians sometimes our minds get polluted. I remember a fellow one time said, oh, Bill, listen, I look at everything on TV and it doesn't bother me in the slightest. 
I said, okay, then one of two things is true. One, either you're lying to me, or two, you're not a normal person. Which is it? He stared at the floor a while and he said, okay, you got me. I said, haven't there been times when you were reading the Bible and all of a sudden there flashed into your mind some dirty thing you saw on TV? You shook his head up and down. I said, haven't you been praying sometimes and all of a sudden your mind was flooded with something you've seen on TV? It was evil. Yes, he said, I have. I suppose all of us have. Dear people, we've got to monitor that thing. And if you can't, I have a friend, you know, back in Saskatoon. And uh, his kids, he was getting after his kids for attending uh, salacious movies, you know. And they said, well, Dad, you sit there with your nose stuck in front of the TV set all the time. What's the difference? You know what he did? He rolled over and grabbed the TV set and jerked the cord out of the wall and hollered, Open that back door! So one of the kids went open and he went rolling through the thing and he threw it right over the fence. And they had, you know, concrete lanes. Well, that was that. I'm not saying you should do that. But I wouldn't complain if you did. I've got a TV set. We like to watch the news and the documentaries. But dear people, to keep your mind clear, clean, what are the things we're supposed to be thinking of? Remember Psalm 101, verse 3? I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. That's a verse we Christians need to think about. So we sit that, that evil thing there. So something dirty comes on and you put up with it and it'll be off in a little bit. It gets a little clean. There's something dirty again. And, and you know, people were doing it and our kids are watching. Lots of Christian parents use a TV set as, as a babysitter for their kids. Somebody was telling us just, was it today or yesterday, about, uh, they, they saw this program, I guess it was this morning. They saw a program, well, they didn't see it this morning, but they saw it some while ago. And this guy was saying, I let my kids watch everything on TV that they want to look at except Jerry Falwell. I mean, that's the way the world is. But some of us are just as bad. A pure heart. I know there's many Christians who feel it's impossible. You can't have a pure heart because you have a wicked heart. Is that how you feel? Why then did Jesus say, blessed are the pure in heart? As far as he was concerned, some people have pure hearts. And basically, a pure heart is 2 Corinthians 7, 1. At least that's the majority part of it. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness, of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. People, it's when we get serious before God in the prayer room or wherever, on our knees before, face before God, and tell God the problem, I've got a filthy heart, I've got a debauched mind, I'm full of this garbage. Repent of it, dear people. Paul said he whenever we're preaching two things, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. In that order, by the way. Repentance from dead works and faith toward God, the writer of Hebrews said. In that order. You see, we, need to, we just need to repent with all, with all our heart. You'll seek me and find me, he said, when you search me with all your heart. A pattern in purity. Are you that to your family, your church, whatever we're supposed to be? A pattern of good works, a pattern in doctrine, a pattern in long-suffering. Whatever God may call us to go through. Let no man despise you, but be an example. Earn it in these following six ways. Earn it. To the glory of God. I want to close. The positive side of things is not really possible apart from something I read in the book of Titus chapter 1. It says... Not self-willed. Not self-willed. Are you a self-willed person? You do what you want to do? And then get God to rubber stamp your plans? It'll never work. We'll keep on stumbling and falling the rest of our life, fruitless without power, until we get to the place where we're not self-willed. Ephesians 6, the opposite side, says, Doing the will of God from the heart. In the sense of Psalm 40, which is in part a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ, I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Yes, your law is within my heart. You delight 
to do the will of God. People say, well, most of the time I don't know what the will of God is. Well, then turn to Psalm 143, 8 and 10. It says, Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. That's verse 8. Verse 10 says, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. People, don't be satisfied until you have a pure heart. Until these other things are true. I mean, they're simple things. And certainly since God has asked us to be this and do this and live this way, His power is here to make it possible for us to live this kind of life. The only thing is, it has to be on His terms. You can't bargain with God. Jacob tried. Dear God, if you'll do this and 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 and bring me home to my father's house in peace, then I'll give you a tenth of everything I possess. What a bargain. Pray tell me, what would God want want with a bunch of flea-bitten sheep and camels? You know, that's all he had to give, really. You don't bargain with God, dear people. You come, oh, listen, just doing the will of God from the heart because, Romans 12, the will of God is good and acceptable and perfect. If it's good, it's not bad. If it's acceptable, it's something you can do. If it's perfect, you can't improve on it. So why not go for it? But people are so afraid that if we surrender to God, He's going to make us do something we can't do, something we don't want to do, something that's going to hurt us in our family. You know what it comes back to? It comes back to a very simple thing. We don't really believe the Bible is true for us today. We frame it, we frame the promises sometimes, we admire them, but we don't live by them. Well, God bless you all.